ബഹുമാനപ്പെട്ട അധ്യക്ഷൻ ശ്രീ എം കെ രാഘവൻ നമ്മുടെ ഉദ്ഘാടകൻ ഇന്നലെ ഇന്നലെ നമ്മൾ സംസാരിച്ച സേറ ജോസഫ് ശ്രീ എൻ ഇ മനോഹർ ശ്രീ എൻ ഇ സുധീർ ഷി വി പി എലിയാസ് ഇവിടെ ഇരിക്കുന്ന പ്രസിദ്ധപ്പെട്ട എഴുത്തുകാരെ ഞാൻ രണ്ടുപേരുടെ പുസ്തകം പ്രകാശനം ചെയ്യാൻ പോവുകയാണ് ഇന്ന് രാവിലെ ശ്രീ ശ്രീമതി സൽമാർ ശ്രീമതി പ്രിയ മനോഹർ ആ വേദിയിലും സദസ്സിരിക്കുന്ന എല്ലാ അക്ഷരപ്രേമികളെ എല്ലാവർക്കും എൻ്റെ വിനീതമായ നമസ്കാരം ഞാൻ ഒരു ഹെൽത്ത് വാർണിംഗ് ഉടനെ പറയട്ടെ എനിക്ക് തന്ന ടോപ്പിക് ദ പവർ ഓഫ് ദ വേൾഡ് അപ്പോൾ അതിനെക്കുറിച്ച് ഞാനൊരു ഇംഗ്ലീഷിൽ എഴുതുന്ന ഒരു എഴുത്തുകാരനായ കാരണം എൻ്റെ പ്രഭാഷണം ഇംഗ്ലീഷിലായിരിക്കും അതുകൊണ്ട് ആ ഭാഷയിൽ കേൾക്കാൻ ഇഷ്ടമില്ലാത്തവർ ഒരു പക്ഷേ ഈ വേദിയിൽ നിന്ന് ഇറങ്ങി ഈ സദസ്സിൽ നിന്ന് ഇറങ്ങി പോകേണ്ടി വരും പക്ഷെ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ നിൽക്കാൻ ആവശ്യമില്ല പല കസാരകളും ഇവിടെ ഉണ്ട് എന്ന് വന്നിരുന്നോളൂ അതാണ് എനിക്കൊന്ന് പറയാനുള്ളത് So friends and lovers of literature I hope that covers everybody it's indeed an honor for me to be delivering this year's Balakrishna Maharaj memorial lecture and I'm privileged to be asked to speak on the power of the word in a world riven by hatred and intolerance where an attempt is being made to muzzle the voices of those clamoring for their inalienable rights and where writers are often attacked as Sara Joseph reminded us for offending mercurial sensibilities we can in no way overlook the importance of the word because without words we would not be able to express ourselves without words we would not be able to understand each other i'll be speaking today about the power of literature and writing and how they can be used to affect meaningful change barbara tuckman the pulitzer prize winning american historian once wrote that books are the carriers of civilization without books history is silent literature is dumb science is crippled thought and speculation are at a standstill without books the development of civilization would have been impossible they are engines of change windows on the world and lighthouses erected in the sea of time they are companions teachers magicians bankers of the treasures of the mind books are humanity in print i think that's really beautifully expressed and i want to share that with you because perhaps no one embodied this as profoundly as shri balakrishna maharaj himself whose love of books and reading was not born of a sheltered childhood having lost his father as a toddler balakrishna maharaj had to drop out of school at a young age a very early age when he was still in class 6 to shoulder the onerous burden of being the sole breadwinner of the family his family was in dire financial straits and to alleviate their woes he began hawking newspapers by day and by afternoon and evening he sold books thus began his lifelong tryst with books one which would ultimately enshrine him in all our hearts as one of kerala's leading publishers from purveying books on foot in kozhikode he graduated to cycling about town on that alluring green bicycle that you can see outside with a bag full of books slung around either shoulder and of course some tied to the back with scarcely any money to buy himself food shri maharaj would survive merely on tap water relentlessly striving to get to book lovers as he relates in his autobiography kanir in the madhuryam their daily quota of newspapers periodicals journals and books in this incarnation balakrishna maharaj himself was a carrier of civilization his was a single man's crusade to spread the love of words which inaugurated a silent revolution in the reading culture of korikod growing from strength to strength by dint of his sees the stoil shri maharaj founded the original seminal touring book stall which of course all of you in korikode endearingly call tbs in a one room space on sm street in 1958 through tbs he sought to deliver books at his clients doorsteps thus bringing the process of reading and buying books far closer to people's homes and hearts shortly afterward in 1963 he established purna publishing a redoubtable pillar of malayalam publishing So far I'm told the TBS in collaboration with Purna Publishing has brought out close to 10,000 books including those of such stalwarts as Takage Shiva Shankar Pillai, G Shankar Kurup, 
Akitam, SK Potekar, ONV Kurup, MT Vasudevan Nair, UNA Khader, Jifri Tangal, and Urub. The royalties that he faithfully paid often helped to keep these great writers at an early stage of their lives, keep their heads above water. All of us as lovers of books must be grateful to Sri Balakrishna Maharaj for his immense contribution to the world of Malayalam literature and also for the avuncular warmth with which he famously encouraged and supported budding writers. It is individuals like him who remind us that books are not merely tiny black squiggles on white paper enclosed between two covers. They are instead products of the tireless struggle of several people, not just writers, but also editors, publishers, typesetters, designers, printers, distributors, and bookshop salespeople, as well as a lonely man on a bicycle. Without those people and that intimate, tender human touch, literature of any kind is simply not possible. In fact, that 20,000 square foot shop that the TBS became completely dedicated to the celebration of language and learning is his, is his legacy. And I think in many ways, what Mr. Marad's life story tells us is that success holds true value when it has been fueled by a purpose that seeks to help society prosper. His dream has created a publishing house and a bookstore that remains the oldest and most trusted in South India for the last seven decades. And his autobiography fittingly won the prestigious Abu Dhabi Shakti Award for autobiography in 2006. We all sadly lost him last year, but we are fortunate that his son, Fiani Manohar, is taking his invaluable legacy forward. As Salman Rushdie has often said, humans are the only species who to understand themselves and the world around them better, tell each other stories, stories to make sense of our world. And if it were not for such souls as Sri Balakrishna Mara, the stories of our world and our society would remain woefully untold. It's therefore for me all the more an honor to deliver a lecture in celebration of his memory and rich legacy. Now, not a day goes by these days without my being asked, mostly by young children, egged on by enthusiastic parents, what they must do to develop a formidable vocabulary. My answer is inevitably just a single word, read. In fact, it worries me today that reading for so many children is no longer associated with pleasure. Reading instead is entwined with books, textbooks, and studies confined to the drudgery of school obligations. So when it comes to pleasure, most youngsters nowadays prefer looking at a screen, their mobile phone or laptop, PlayStation or Nintendo. It would not, I think, be wrong to say that the COVID-19 pandemic, when one was helplessly cloistered at home, exacerbated the menace of the screen. Off late, I've met too many children who have never read a book for pleasure or entertainment, only for a classroom assignment. This is a terrible loss, and failing to convey the joy of reading is probably the biggest mistake that successive generations of parents and teachers have allowed themselves to make. But of course, there is still time to remedy the situation so long as we recognize the problem and work to rectify it. My own childhood was rather different. Growing up as a child of middle-class parents in urban India, in Mumbai and later Calcutta, in the late 50s and 60s, meant growing up with books. Television did not exist in the Bombay of my boyhood. iPhones, laptops, Nintendo and Playstations were not even a gleam in an inventor's eye, let alone mobile phones. And if your siblings were, as in my case, two younger sisters with an age difference of four and six years from me, there was only one thing to do when you weren't with your friends, read. And as a young asthmatic child, I was frequently confined to bed struggling to breathe, and reading was my only solution. I read copiously, rapidly, and indiscriminately. Because of the chronic asthma, I found so much pleasure in the books piled up at my bedside that I stopped resenting my illness. 
Reading became the central focus of my existence. There was not a day in my childhood that did not feature a book or several. One year, I foolishly set myself the challenge of reading 365 books. I kept a list of the volumes I finished. Comics didn't count. And indeed, I reached 365 before Christmas. But I told my sons, never do this. Never read to a deadline. Read for pleasure, because fulfilling that deadline interferes with the joy of reading. An abiding memory is of my mother coming into my room around 11 every night and switching off the light. I wasn't smart enough to think of holding a flashlight under the covers, but sometimes I would wait for my parents to fall asleep in their room, then surreptitiously switch my light on again to finish the book they had interrupted. The journey that begins the adventure of reading is often ignited by a single book and, of course, by a parent. It was my mother who started me off on this journey to begin with, because when I was still in diapers, she would read to me from the noddy books of Enid Blyton, stories about a nodding wooden doll and his friends in Toyland. My mother jokes that she read them so badly that I couldn't wait to grab the books from her by myself, and so before I was three, I was reading Noddy, and soon moving on to read other stories by Blyton, the world's most prolific children's author, whose prodigious output of over 200 books could take you through an entire childhood. It was only the beginning, though. The classroom, with its British-inspired curriculum, was a rich source of inspiration. At the age of nine, I was already getting Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare. At 10, Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist, both unabridged. And the bard himself, Shakespeare, mildly expurgated, made an appearance on the syllabus when I was 11. In the same year, an otherwise detestable teacher dictated a passage from P.G. Woodhouse at a spelling test and launched me on the first great literary passion of my life. There were also several Indian stories that I raced through. In those days, sadly, there were few good Indian children's books available in English in a market still dominated by the British. The one area where Indian publishers could hold their own was in retelling the Indian classics. I remember several versions of the traditional tales I'd heard from my grandmother, episodes from the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, which later inspired my first novel, and the fables of the ancient Jatakas and the Panchatantra. The other Indian stories I remember enjoying as a, tried were, as a child were clever short stories about Birbal and Tenali Raman, two wise and witty men from opposite corners of the country who resolved problems in what were essentially extended anecdotes. So mine was all in all an eclectic childhood. I suppose it's a uniquely Indian experience to embrace both Blyton and Birbal, Jeeves and the Jatakas, Tintin and Tenali Raman in your reading. What persists, and I have no doubt forever will, is a vivid sense of books devoured as sources of entertainment, of education, of escape, and of experience, albeit vicarious experience. These are the very same emotions that we as parents, educators, and mentors must create for our own children. Books are like the toddy tapper's hatchet, cutting through the rough husks that enshroud our minds to tap into the exhilaration that ferments within. We owe it to our children to help, to help them open their minds to these possibilities by making reading fun again. Perhaps we can start, even with inappropriate reading, as some people consider it, comics. Just letting the children get into the habit of picking up something that is not a screen and reading it. Comics can have interesting themes, be alluring to look at and stimulating of thought. It's the child's curiosity that we must aim to pique, and in so doing, pave the way forward for them to begin their own adventure of reading. That is the power of the word. What more should I say about it? Writers, after all, are supposed to write. We should leave the pontificating to the critics. But once in a while, even writers are forced to think about their craft, to interrogate themselves. Sarah Joseph did so just a few days ago in a lovely speech at Maharaja's College in Inakulam. I was obliged to do so some years ago when I found myself the subject of a long interview which included the somewhat startling question do you think your text belongs to you? I suppose it was inevitable that sooner or later a professor of literature would ask me this postmodernist question. 
It came from a Dr. Ranjan Ghosh of the University of Bardwan near Kolkata. And faced with his earnest and impressively theoretical approach to my work, I had to explain that I not only have never taken a writing course, I didn't even study literature at university. I thought that would be like learning about girls at a medical school. <laughs> Indeed, my favorite craft, my favorite story of the craft of teaching writing, I know Malayali audiences are usually very humorless, you better laugh at this one, <laughs> is that of the British instructor who told his writing students that to ensure commercial success, a story needs to contain religion, aristocracy, remember it's Britain, religion, aristocracy, sex, and mystery, and be brief. The briefest submission duly came in one sentence long. My God, exclaimed the Duchess of Argyle, I'm pregnant. Who did it? <laughs> religion, aristocracy, sex, and mystery, all in the right order and stunningly brief. The instruction couldn't be bettered. The teacher gave up. Now, just as well, for writing to me is a wholly instinctual activity. It is about expressing your most intimate feelings and thoughts, and it is as much you as the way you breathe. Nor would I want anyone else to tell me how to write. In my writing, I've always seen the telling of the tale as being as important to me as its author, as the tale itself. My text belongs to me in the sense that the words I have chosen to employ are the only ones that are authentic to what I have tried to convey. The same story, the same concerns can obviously be told or expressed by different writers in different ways. My way is the way in which my text has chosen to tell itself through me. And in that form, it belongs solely to me. I'm glad to see Sarah nodding in agreement. But I've often felt as a writer that I'm giving expression to something beyond myself, something that emerges from a different realm that I perhaps unconsciously tap into in the act of writing. To that degree, the text is both mine and beyond me, an artifact that emerges like a stream from the ocean of stories, the Katha Sarita, uh, the, 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 the Katha Sarita Samudram, that I've been, Sagara, that I have been privileged to channel in my readers. For that, channel to my readers. For that reason, I'm prepared to accept the notion that my texts may contain hidden meanings of which I myself was not conscious in the act of writing. This is certainly true of painters, who may find something emerging from the brush strokes that they have applied on a canvas that was not wholly present in their mind when they were wielding the brush. Though text seems more limiting than paint, the principle is essentially the same for all art. Of course, the critic who reads meanings in the author did not consciously intend is guilty of a form of subversion. And the author is entitled to argue back that his text does not support the critic's analysis. There, the onus is on the critic to make his case and for the fair-minded reader to draw her own conclusions. My 25 books have all, in different ways, been about my personal exploration of India, of the forces that have made it and nearly unmade it, of the historical and philosophical traditions that have shaped the Indian identity. While this is explicit in my 21 books of nonfiction, my four books of fiction to which Mr. Sudhir has alluded today have also sought to explore the Indian condition, particularly by looking at the kinds of stories that Indians tell about themselves, whether the stories of our epics and of our nationalist struggle, as in the great Indian novel, or the stories of our popular cinema, as in show business, or the stories of the identities and histories we construct for ourselves, as in riot. In all three novels, though each is very different from the other two, it is true to say that the architecture of the book speaks of an India of multiple stories, multiple perspectives, multiple tellers, and multiple truths. So if I were to come back to the great Indian novel, three or four people today have talked about it to me before I got on stage. I had rather overtly staked a claim for the tasks of my kind of fiction, to affirm and enhance an Indian cultural identity, to broaden understanding of the Indian cultural and historical heritage, 
and to reclaim for Indians the story of India's national experience and its own reassertion of itself, including the triumphs and disappointments of independence. My story in the great Indian novel was about the kinds of stories that Indians have been telling themselves, both the Mahabharata and the story of the nationalist movement. And in it, I set out to explore what has made India, what is the nature of truth in life as in fiction, in tradition as in history. My second novel, Show Business, also deals with the stories Indian society tells itself, except that instead of the older myths, I have seized on the contemporary myths invented by modern Hindi cinema. One is always looking for new creative metaphors to explore the Indian condition. And in a country of widespread illiteracy, especially when I wrote the book, a majority of Indians were still illiterate in 1991, a country where popular film represents the primary vehicle for the, trans, for the transmission of the fictional experience, then cinema is a particularly useful vehicle for this exploration. Can one use the power of the word to explore the power of the image? In addition, there are some interesting issues that emerge from the subject itself. The social and political relevance of popular cinema in India, for instance, has been dealt with surprisingly little in Indian fiction in English. And the whole process of the manufacture of our modern myths on celluloid is one that I found fascinating as a creative issue in itself. My concern was both with the question, what do these stories reveal about ourselves? And with a distinct second set of questions, how are these stories told? What do they mean to those who make them and those who view them? How do these stories relate to their lives? In riot, the exploration of the build-up to and the eruption of a Hindu-Muslim riot leads me to raise fundamental questions about the nature of truth, the construction of identity, the invention and reclaiming of the past, the uses of history, and the various collisions that life offers, collisions between cultures, between attitudes to life, between ideologies, between religious communities, and between men and women. Unlike the other two, this is not a satirical novel, and so it involved an important departure for me as a writer. And in many ways, when I talk about my own books, it is to show you where I thought the power of the word could be applied so to some of my major intellectual preoccupations about India. I once said to an interviewer, this is a long time ago, India matters to me, and through my writing, I would like to matter to India. The lines have been quoted back to me a great deal, and perhaps they sound more grandiose than I had intended. But the issue of national allegiance, they claim, is real enough. For the task of the writer, if one can say such a thing, is to find new ways and revive old ones of expressing one's culture. Just as your society strives through development to find new ways of being and becoming. In turn, the challenge of finding these new ways obliges the novelist not just to find new stories to tell, but new ways to tell them. For me as a writer, the way I tell the story is as important to me as the story itself. The manner in which the narrative unfolds is as integral to the novel as the story it tells and as essential, I hope, to the experience of the reader. I've always believed that as the very word novel suggests, there must be something innovative about every book I set out to write. In Riot, for example, I perhaps explored the, the power of the word by telling the story through newspaper clippings, diary entries, interviews, transcripts, journals, scrapbooks, even poems written by the characters. In other words, using a different dozen voices, different stylistic forms for different fragments of the story. So the structure of the novel served a substantive purpose in pointing to different perceptions of truth and history, and therefore of the Indian reality. The narrative suggests that omniscience is not possible. The reader is in the hands of a dozen subjective narrators and feels that truth is indeed a word 
that can be modified by a possessive pronoun, a question I first asked in the great Indian novel. Riot is also a book you can read in any order, though ideally you should read it from beginning to end. You can pick it up from any chapter, go back or forward to any other chapter, and you will bring a different level of awareness to the story. In so doing, you would recreate my text as your own. Some Indian critics still suggest that there is something artificial and un-Indian about an Indian writing in English. One critic disparagingly declared that the acid test ought to be, could this have been written only by an Indian? And in his view, the Indian writing in English for the most part fails that test. Now, I have not, never been much of a literary theoretician, as I already said at the beginning, but for most, though not all of my own writing, I would answer that my works could not only have only been written by an Indian, but only by an Indian in English. I write for anyone who will read me, but first of all, for Indians like myself. Indians who have grown up speaking, writing, playing, wooing, and quarreling in English all over India. No writer really chooses a language. The circumstances of his upbringing ensure that the language chooses him. Members of this class have entered the groves of academy and condemned themselves in terms of bitter self-reproach. One Indian scholar, Professor Harish Trivedi, has asserted in English that Indian writers in that language are cut off from the experiential mainstream and from that common cultural matrix shared with writers of all other Indian languages, unquote. Trivedi metaphorically cites the fictional English medium school in an R.K. Narayan story, whose students must first rub off the sandalwood paste caste marks from their foreheads before they enter its portals. Quote again from Trivedi, for this golden gate is only for the, de, the deracine, the deracinated, the rootless to pass through for those who have erased their antecedents, unquote. It's an evocative image, though even though I thought that the secular Indian state was supposed to encourage the erasure of casteism from the classroom. But the more important point is that writers like myself do share a common cultural matrix, albeit one devoid of helpfully identifying caste marks. It is one that consists of an urban upbringing and a pan-national outlook on the Indian reality. I do not think this is less authentically Indian than the worldviews of writers in other Indian languages. Why should the rural peasant or the small town school teacher with his sandalwood smeared forehead be considered more quintessentially Indian than the um, music loving collegian or the Bombay socialite who are also as much part of the Indian reality? India is a vast and complex country. In Walt Whitman's famous phrase, it contains multitudes. I write of an India of multiple truths and multiple realities, an India that is greater than the sum of its parts. English expresses that diversity better than any Indian language I know, precisely because it is not rooted in any one region of my vast country. At the same time, as an Indian, I remain conscious of and connected to my pre-urban and non-Anglophone antecedents. My novels reflect an intellectual heritage that embraces as I mentioned, the Mahabharata, our own Autumn Dullal, of which my father was a gifted practitioner, and the Hindi B-movies of Bollywood, along with Shakespeare, Woodhouse, and the Beatles. Why not? As a first-generation urbanite myself, I kept returning throughout my years, and uh, my childhood in particular, to the Kerala villages of my parents in Palakkad. And in my life, as in my writing, I kept returning to Kerala. Yes, I have grown up in Bombay, Calcutta, and Delhi, and each of those Indian cities is a thousand miles apart from each other. The mother of my children is half Kashmiri, half Bengali. My own mother used to live for many years in the southern town, the Tamil town of Coimbatore. And this may be a wider cultural matrix than the good Dr. Trivedi imagined, but it draws from a rather broad range of Indian experience. And English is the language that brings these various threads of my India together. 
the language in which my former wife could speak to my mother-in-law, to her mother-in-law, the language that enabled a Calcutton to function in Coimbatore, a language that serves to express the complexity of the polyphonous Indian experience better than any other language that I know. Inevitably, the English language fundamentally affects the content of each of my books. But it does not determine the audience of the writer. Because as long as translations exist, language is a vehicle and not a destination. Of course, there is no shame in acknowledging that English is a legacy of the colonial connection, but one that is no less useful and valid than the railways, the telegraphs, or the law courts that were also left behind by the British. Historically, English helped us to find our Indian voice, that great nationalist, Jawaharlal Nehru wrote his discovery of India in English. But the eclipse of that dreadful phrase, the Indo-Anglian novel, has occurred precisely because Indian writers have evolved well beyond the British connection to their native land. The days when Indians wrote novels in English, either to flatter or to rail against their colonial masters, are well behind us. Now we have Indians in India writing as naturally about themselves in English as Australians or South Africans do, and their tribe has been supplemented by India's rich diaspora in the United States, which has already produced an impressive crop of, uh, of, of novelists with Pulitzer Prizes and National Book Awards to their names. Their addresses don't matter because writers really live inside their own heads and on the page, and geography is merely a circumstance. They write secure of themselves and their heritage of diversity, and they write free of the anxiety of audience, for theirs are narratives that appeal as easily to foreigners as to Indians, and indeed to readers, irrespective of their ethnicity. Surely that's the whole point about literature, that for a body of fiction to constitute a literature, it must rise above its origins, its setting, even its language, to render accessible to a reader anywhere some insight into the human condition. Read my books and those of other Indian writers, not because we are Indian, not necessarily because you're interested in us or in the country, <coughs> but because these books are worth reading in and of themselves. And so, each time you pick up one of my books, ask not for whom I write, I write for you. So to go back to the question that that professor asked me, does my text belong to me? As Sudhir has already quoted me saying, so but for latecomers perhaps it might be interesting, I write, as George Bernard Shaw said, for the reason, the same reason that a cow gives milk. It's inside me, it's got to come out, and in a real sense I would suffer if I couldn't. It's the way I express my reaction to the world I live in, to the world I see around me, and the world I try to imagine. It would be as futile to claim ownership of it as for a cow to assert that she owns the milk she has provided. No, dear reader, the text no longer belongs to me. It belongs to you. Thank you very much.